It's a pleasure to be here. It's hard to believe it's been three years. So about a year ago, you know, Stan and I got together. And, well, we get together almost every day on, on the phone. And we said, I think we really have to have something in person. All right? And we knew that COVID would still be around. We appreciate everybody being here all right, under the circumstances. And uh, because we got to get on with it. And we missed you all. So with that, uh, off to the keynote we go. And what I'd like to have a discussion on here, uh, Stan and I, is a little bit about the differences and the similarity between aerospace and dimensional insight, since tonight we'll be at the museum. And starting out, you know, it, it kind of goes back to your culture. It goes back to your guiding principles. And we'll talk a little bit about that throughout the course of, of, of the keynote. And then we're going to be focused, if you will, on the areas on the right-hand side of the screen. So we're going to talk a little bit about technology and, and competitive advantage and simplicity and roadmaps and tracking. And most important, customer success. So with that, let's, let's begin. When we talk about foundational technology, if you're in the aviation area, it really starts, all right, with the, with, let's say, the commercial airplane. So this is an image of Everett, uh, state of Washington, where Boeing makes the 777. And it kind of goes together like uh, building blocks. You know, they build these sections of the airplane, and then they just put them together. But as you look at this screen, you can really see that it's just absolutely mammoth. And there's just a lot going on. And there's a lot going on, all right, with you all and Dimensional Insight. So how do all those pieces come together, all right, to make something, all right, that weighs, you know, a half a million pounds and flies through the air? Well, it requires a tremendous amount of teamwork. Right, and you can kind of see that in this image, right? But it all starts with, with a foundation. And with that, Stan, why don't you tell us about our foundation? Well, with, our, with our foundation, uh, oops, uh, here is our architecture uh, for, that we've uh, built over the years. Uh, and again, just that they have uh, uh, building blocks uh, there too. Uh, in the beginning, we had the data management uh, with the builder and the integrator and the uh, business intelligence. And the two were, were made to integrate with each other. And uh, part of the goal that we had, even from the beginning, is speed to get the data to you as fast as possible. And of course, you want the trust in the data to make sure that it's right and it's correct. Uh, and then, you know, once you have the data, you want to automate that so it happens nightly or weekly or whenever the data gets updated. And then finally, at the end, is uh, you want to visualize the data, and that's what you use with the, uh, the business intelligence side, uh, allowing people to navigate to it and show the uh, screens that they, that they want. Um, and therefore, in a sense, we're going to put together a puzzle, right? And here's our puzzle. And the very first piece is our foundational technology that we just talked about. Now, as we move forward, right, let's talk about our applications. Because here, you might have this foundation, which in aerospace, let's say, is that plane. But then it's, how do you outfit it? How do you make it different so that each carrier has something all right, that's unique. Well, that's different paint, different interiors, et cetera. In fact, you can have carriers all right, that have bought the same aircraft, and the bathroom is in a different position, you know, depending upon when they bought the plane, where they wanted the bathroom, or the galley, or the seating. Right? So that's how they differentiate themselves. All right? And we have applications as well, right, which are built on top. 
and our applications are linked together also. So here's an example, right, where we have healthcare and we might have hospital operations and surgery and ED and so forth, right? But they're sharing the patient, if you will, right? When we get over to beverage alcohol, same concept, right? You might be a supplier or a distributor. You might be doing something with a survey or inventory. But again, all of these applications have to be tied together, right? And they have to support the entire enterprise. So, you know, we have the plane, and then it's how do we outfit it, right? And our applications allow us to reduce the time that it takes to create something that the user can use, right? And that's denoted, all right, by this slide here, all right? When we started out, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right, everything was custom. And it took a fairly long time. But with the passing of time and you move towards these applications, right, you want to be able to get something up and going quicker. And you can't be pre-built. And then you make modification. Right? So that's what we're doing with our applications. So each application that you folks utilize are tweaked all right, to your unique environment. And at the top of the screen, you have your database, you have your measures. Some of you are using measures, some are not. Right? But you have a database and you have your displays. And you can see by those up and down arrows that you've got to go work through that process. Because as Stan mentioned earlier, you have to have that integrity. And by having these pre-built applications as a start, it allows you to make that trip faster. Right? So that's our applications. And now as we move forward, right, let's talk about competitive advantage. And here, I want to spend a few minutes because we have the Boeing 737 MAX, all right? 5,000 have been booked, and we have the 320 Nero, and there's been 8,000 booked. Right. Now, Boeing is about 100 years old, and Airbus is around 50. Airbus, as some of you might be aware, is kind of a collection. All right, so there's activity all right, in France and Germany, Italy, the UK, etc. Right. And they've all come together all right, to, to build aircraft. Right. Now for years, Boeing was the leader. Boeing will never be the leader now. Airbus will always be the leader in commercial aircraft. Right. And why is that? Well, Boeing made some, in my mind, some mistakes. Right. If we take a look at the fuselage, which is in the upper right, notice that the 320 is substantially larger. Right? Which part of the fuselage? Well, this would be the cross section. The whole thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So when you walk in, all right, and, and, and you're looking at that 320, all right, the cross section is just bigger. Right. So when you get on board a 320, you have a little more space between the seats all right, for your luggage. All right. Your seats are a little bit wider. Right. Now, that fuselage was created in 1987. Right. The Boeing fuselage goes all the way back to 1958. They've never changed it. All right. So you have approximately 30 years there. Right. Boeing should have made a bigger fuselage in terms of its width. So it could compete better. Because, well, I can't speak for all of you, but I've gotten bigger with time. 
all right? And we all might want a little wider seat. Right? So what is a more comfortable airplane to ride in? It's the Airbus. Right? So Boeing had an opportunity to compete, and they decided not to. And Stan and I, when we get together and we discuss things along with others, right, we ask ourselves, okay, how do we compete? Because you can't just decide to compete today. This is something that goes over a period of time. And Boeing just decided that they weren't going to compete. They were just going to make money. But the problem goes beyond that. If you look down at the lower end, notice that the 320 sits up higher, all right, than the 737. Why is that? Well, when the 737 was designed, all right, the airports were different. So the airplane itself has stairs because you wanted to be able to walk out and climb up the stairs and get in the plane. But 30 years later, Airbus said, we don't need that anymore. Our airports have become more modern. We have the jet ramp. So they raised it up. Boeing never did that. So what does that mean? Well, if you look over on the right-hand side, right? The wing on a 737 is much lower to the ground. And the distance between the wing and the ground is where the engine goes. So now that engine is very close to the, to the ground. So when they came out with the MAX, they had to actually push the engine forward. right? And that changed all sorts of things in the plane, all right? And Airbus can continue to put bigger engines on because they've got the room to do it, whereas in the Boeing model, you're running out of space, all right? So what this really means is if you want competitive advantage, you don't think about it just today. You have to think about it over years. All right, and you have to put together the underlying technology right, so that you, it can support the company over a long period of time. And in this situation, Boeing didn't do that. Now, it's even worse than that because Boeing's corporate headquarters at once time was out in Seattle about 20 years ago, they moved their corporate headquarters to Chicago. And last year, they moved their corporate headquarters outside of DC, here. Right? So, where's your engineer? And where's your corporate headquarters? Right? Well, that changes your culture, All right? Someone asked me one time, are you an engineering company or are you a marketing company? And I said, we're an engineering company, All right? Because we want to provide great technology, all right, to you all. We're not marketing, we're not finance, All right? Boeing, on the other side of the coin, is drifting more towards the finance side. All right? And the marketing side, because in D.C. you can lobby. All right? But when we start talking about that technology, all right, I want to pass it back to Stan, and he can talk about our philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, this is, on the left, you see a slide from Gartner talking about um, the, the, the best way, the various uh, advantages of different ways of, uh, of delivering uh, an app. 
And uh, as you see highlighted, uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest advantage comes from having a native app. And why are we able to do that as a relatively small company? Uh, it's because we've been around for so long. People who are, you know, companies which are jumping into this space, and there are, have been a lot of them, or really only have the ability to do either the web app and maybe get that over to a progressive web app, which is the second column. And um, you know, this all comes from what we, we, we call it a philosophy advantage. And our you know, philosophy of, of, of our company is there on the uh, lower right, is we believe that by supporting the customer and employee, uh, the customer and employee will support Dimensional Insight. And if you've been to the conferences before, you know, you hear, you hear it every time. And it's what we believe and it's, it's what we do. And what that allows us is to, uh, you know, to find and maintain and, and hire um, and keep amazing employees who you see around us here and uh, really maintain that kind of effort and, and create the long term, uh, the long term effort to be able to come up with a native app, which is the ideal case. I mean, sometimes you know your IT organization may not allow you to do that, but uh, you have it and you can make use of it. So, uh, this is where we have a philosophy advantage. Uh, some very old school, I would say. So, and uh, in, in terms of uh, and, and because of that, we have the technology. We have to be able to focus though with the staff that we have. Uh, this is a Dresner slide in 2013 talking about the various technologies uh, that are there. And uh, we can basically uh, focus on the top 30% of features and functionality uh, that, is, that are needed uh, by our customers because no company is going to be able to handle them all or go into them all. But we pick and choose what we think is important to you and then, uh, uh, and then uh, develop to that with the staff that we have. Another puzzle piece, competitive advantage. What's our advantage? It's our staff. It's our direction, it's our vision. Continuous improvement. Well, let's take a look here at what's going on in the world of Mars. You know, notice that the first two solar panels, right? But they all have six wheels. That way, if one gets stuck, the other five will continue to work, right? Notice that the first two were lightweight, right? In fact, they were landed in kind of a gigantic balloon that bounced, and then it popped out and, uh, and away it went. But the life expectancy of a solar panel on Mars is limited because you get dust over time on the solar panel. So what was the next step? Well, the next step, all right, was to go nuclear. All right. Some of you probably have heard about this Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and it's out beyond our solar system now. It's out in truly outer space. That's powered by plutonium, right? And it's been out there and we're working for 45 years. Plutonium doesn't give up. <laughs> it's got a long half-life, right? So these two rovers now, right, can work on Mars almost indefinitely, right? Providing, of course, everything continues to, to function. Note that they're also a lot heavier. So they needed a new way to land, the so-called sky crane, right? Where, you know, they're, they're lowered down on a set of cables. Note that the latest one is a little bit heavier. Right? Because you still have the same launch vehicles and so forth, so that you can't double the weight, but you can increase it, you can bring in more scientific instruments, right? But it's continuous improvement. But the real key here is they knew that they could not continue with solar forever. 
So they had to make the switch. But they kept certain things that worked, like the six wheels. And then they moved on to plutonium. Right. Well, we do continuous improvement as well. Thank you. Um, and our continuous improvement is sometimes adding new things over the year. This, is, uh, this shows only the last uh, 20 years uh, you know, uh, that we've, of, of improvements. Uh, we have at least another decade before that uh, until this. In 2004, adding you know, web portal for visualization, mo so new platforms, uh, a new engine that, with Spectre that we introduced in uh, 2014, Workbench uh, 2015, which was an improvement over what we had before, uh, Measures in Engine with Measure Factory, and then combining the clients as part of an integration and uh, the United, Unified Navigation, which we'll talk about shortly. And even once we add a new platform, we don't just sit still there, we continue to improve on things. And uh, for you know, dive port, since 2004, we've been adding new portlets, we've been adding self-service, uh, ch chart portlets, menu portlets, you know, dive tab over the years has improved a lot in the last decade. You know, new, new features, new page types. Uh, workbench, you know, we have James in the back just working on, uh, working on things there along with the Leiden team. So there's just a specter. We have, um, you know, uh, Jamie and, and Lodvik just spending all their time a lot of their time for Jamie, since he does so much, uh, uh, all their time adding features to it um, and uh, improving things over the years. Um, so it's, it's you know what we spend been spending our time on, and it's what we get to deliver to you. So. Another puzzle piece: continuous improvement. And how do we handle complexity? Well, here we have two pictures. One is the space shuttle. We'll see that tonight, although we won't be able to get into the cabin. But you can see there's, there's, there's a lot going on in there. And then you have the Dragon, SpaceX, and you can see you just have some big screens. Now, what's really interesting about this is that when the space program started, there was a debate, and most of the scientists viewed the astronaut to be nothing more than, quote, a big monkey, all right? And the astronauts were really uh, disappointed by this because they wanted, you know, they were pilots and, you know, test pilots, and they wanted to do something, okay? But 50 years later, right, basically, the astronauts have become a bunch of monkeys, all right, because of all of the automation. And in fact, all right, when, you know, the Dragon first went up, it was totally unmanned. It did everything, all right? No human required. So we've actually made a transition, all right? Now, in a sense, you know, they've, they've managed the complexity by simplifying things. And what we've done over the years is with, with this collection of product that we have, it's become complex. And what we need to do is we need to find a way to simplify it. So first of all, you have to take a look at your organization because you might have your DI consultant down underneath helping you. You've got your IT organization, your power users, and finally your end users. Now, all of these different personas, different groups of people, they're all required for success. Right? But the goal here is how do we take the work away from us, Dimensional Insight, and the IT organization and shift it up? All right, so that's the goal. And how do we make it easier for each persona that's using the product, right? Well, you're going to hear a lot today about my library, and this is kind of step one. Right? And I'm pretty excited about this. 
And this is going to make the usability a lot simpler. All right? But I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder. We'll talk about that later. All right? And we have to do this self-service so that the person all right, that comes in at 8 in the morning, all right, if they need to do something a little bit different, they can do that without relying back uh, on the back office, let's say, in the IT organization. All right. So in a sense, then, what is the, the, the big challenge? Well, you have these different personas, the executive, the front line, the analyst, etc. And then you have your various applications. And the challenge is, how do you get from one to the other in an easy manner? And of course, everybody has their own device that they want to use. Well, we all have a smartphone. A lot of us, no doubt, have a tablet. And we all have some form of a PC. Some of us use all three devices. Some of us might only use two. Right? But it's through that device all right, that we get to the application. And then we have how do you display the information? Do you display it in the form of dashboards or reports? Or do you do deep analysis using something like ProDiver? You can start to see the complexity here. So how do we start to integrate all of this together? How do we make it easier? All right. Well, my library is going to help because it's kind of sitting or simple up on top. All right. Now, we're not totally there yet. All right. But that can kind of be like a portal, if you will. All right, so we have to bring that into the equation. All right. And then, if we take a look at our device, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is that device going to do? So if you're looking at and using the phone, well, that can give you, you know, somewhat of a, of a dashboard. Maybe it's a stamp or two. Right? And it can give you some simplified reports. But remember, you only have so much real estate to use. So is it going to be utilizing my library? The answer is no. Well, what about deep analysis? The answer is no. Right? Now, as you proceed to the tablet, because you have more real estate, here you will have my library. You'll have your dashboards. Right? You have your reports, but you won't have deep analysis. Right? You have to wait for the Windows environment to have everything. And we have the Mac here as well because with the new Mac chip, right, um, it's getting closer and closer and, and we can do what's on the tablet on the Mac and so on and so forth. Right? Right? But you will never be able to do ProDiver on the Mac at least not to my knowledge anytime soon, All right, unless you're doing something a little crazy. All right. So you can see how we now have to kind of bring all this together. So how do we do that? All right. Well, that's something called Diver Gateway. And the purpose of Diver Gateway is to integrate all of this together. This is going to take us several years to do. We're just in the process of, of starting. Right? And then we have to simplify our licensing agreements so that you have availability to everything so the license are not, oh, I got ProDiver now or I have Diveport now. No. You just have Gateway. And if you're talking about an application, the person doesn't even know about what, their, what, what that technology is. They just want to look at the display. Right? So we're going to be in the process of integrating all of this together. All right. And then when you combine that, all right, with our applications, we're going to make life a lot simpler for everybody. 
Okay. So this is kind of a goal. This is, this is going to be over the next few years. All right. So that's how we're going to bring engineering simplicity to assist you all. And now we move to co-innovation. Right. And here I have two aircraft. Right. FedEx right, has been using the Caravan since 1984, single engine. Right. A third of their fleet are these small aircraft. And now they're moving to something that's bigger. It's a twin, carries a pallet. All right, and that's coming out in 22. Uh, deliveries are taking place now. Okay. So what co-innovation is, is we're, we're, we're working with you. So we're understanding your needs. Right? Just like in this case, Cessna was understanding what FedEx's needs were. All right? And the reason that we're doing that is because we're customer focused. All right? So you can see here, we're, we're spending a lot of time and energy on development, a lot of time and energy on applications and consulting. Right? We try to minimize those other areas. Right? Because we want to focus our resources towards you. All right? And if we look out over time, right, there's been two major events. Right? One was Spectre, which brought in our Columnar database. Why did we do that? Because there was a lot of volume on the BEV side, and we needed better performance. And over on the healthcare side, there was lots of different KPIs, measures. And we needed a better engine to be able to support that. So here we have a situation right, where, by understanding what you all needed all right, through working together, all right, we created, if you will, these new products. Right? Much like Cessna created a new airplane for FedEx. Right? And then, of course, we have our applications. And our applications evolve, too, all right, as we work with you so that we can put in new features, new functionality into these apps. So for those of you in healthcare, right, in the hospital operations, we're looking at version four. For those of you that might be using program advisor on the BEV side, version four. Right? And as Stan mentioned earlier, right, even if it's under the water, right, the, the base technology, right, we continue to evolve that. Right? So that's co-innovation. And now, we kind of move to a roadmap. And you can see our roadmap here in terms of a collection of aircraft, all right, over time. You know, going all the way back to the early 1900s, um, all the way up to the Airbus, the 380 at the top, all right, and the 7478, um, both of which are no longer in production, by the way. Um, so what is our roadmap? Well, how do we define our roadmap? Well, as I'd mentioned, we look to you to give us that guidance. Right? And we take a look at our guiding principles that Stan mentioned. And of course, we look at the market direction. But really, we're focused on you. All right? So to better explain what that roadmap is, pass it back to Stan. Thank you, Fred. In terms of our roadmap, uh, where we are right now and where we're going, uh, we start with where we are right now. Uh, I want to announce that we are going to be coming out with 7.2. Uh, 7.2 is a smaller release than we normally do in terms of it, it's there so that we can get my library out to you uh, sooner. And as a change in terms of our user conferences, it's actually available now. And we're, you'll hear a lot more about it when uh, Mike, Jamie, and the lab talk about it in the, this section. Uh, but it, it's, uh, we'll have a controlled rollout in terms of, in terms of who gets it uh, net when, but it, we're at 7.2.2. Um, and so, so this is a, a change uh, for us to get, get it. 
there are quick views improvements on it. Um, you hear, you know, spectra improvements, dive line improvements, workbench improvements. You know, you hear it in this in the next 30 mi minute session. And after that, uh, you hear about the the future roadmap, the future uh, directions, uh, where we take my library and bring it over to the uh, to to the iPad to and to um, and to the phones, uh, to the that the new dashboards, uh, Springboard, which you've heard about and is still being worked on uh, in the lab, control charts, uh, which is a big uh, feature that's needed in healthcare, uh, gateway integration that you know Fr Fred talked about in terms of being able to merge in things together. Um, you know, future, futures of measure factories, how do we improve measure factory to make it more usable and the like. So all of that will be in the second 30 minute section that we're, that we're having uh, this morning. And then later on, we'll talk about the futures of the applications. Uh, tomorrow you'll hear about um, the cannabis market, which we're going into. It's uh, somewhat similar to beverage alcohol in terms of the regulatory aspect of it and also the multi-state, the, the very, um, each state has its own regulations and its own market uh, because of the legal situation with that. And, um, and so um, from a beverage alcohol, you're here tomorrow from NABCA about an application that we put together uh, with, with them. Uh, healthcare, uh, George is always uh, thinking of new things to be working on and he'll be talking about uh, updates uh, to existing applications and how we're putting my library in, into those things. So uh, those are uh, applications roadmap that you were here uh, later today, tonight, and tomorrow. So. Another puzzle piece, our roadmap. Now let's talk about service. And here's a cross section of, of, of a jet engine. And without going into a lot of detail, but you can actually see a lot of engines tonight if you, if you want to, all right, in cross sections. Uh, but I'm gonna point out just a couple of things at the bottom. All right, vibration. You really don't want your engine to vibrate. You know, that's got really bad, all right, because it might vibrate apart, all right. Metal in the oil. Oh, that's bad too, all right? Because that means that, that something is rubbing in ways that it shouldn't, and it's throwing off flakes of oil, all right? And then, of course, you've got pressures and temps. So all of that is monitored as you are flying. And all of those details are stored, and actually, some of them are actually downloaded real time, all right? Well, we have to monitor as well, right? right? Because if we monitor, all right, we can then focus on adoption. Right? Because we want everybody in your organization, all right, to be using, all right, what you put together right, so that everyone is more efficient, more productive, all right? And to do that, we have to understand right, what people are doing. We have to track. Right? So yes, we don't have a jet engine. And yes, we're not monitoring the oil pressure. Right? But we have to monitor right, what everybody is doing. Right? Maybe we have activity out there and nobody uses it. Well, should we maintain that? Right? Maybe there's other activities, all right, that have high usage, right? And maybe we can talk to those folks, or you can talk to those folks and say, how can we improve things? Right? And we have a couple of ways of doing that. We have a US version and we have a Netherlands version. And I might add, all right, that in Ireland, all right, they've done some really great work on this as well. But it's really critical, all right, that we understand what's really going on, all right, in the base. Just like it's really critical to understand what's going on in that jet engine, right? Because you want everything to run smoothly, all right? 
So that's tracking progress. And now we have one puzzle piece left. And that's customer success. Stan, my goal, everyone's goal at Dimensional Insight is how do we make you successful? We have no outside funding. All right. You folks keep us alive. All right. So we have to support you to the best of our ability. All right. And as Dad mentioned, here's our philosophy again. So our goal is to take care of the customer and to take care of the employee. All right. Now when we start talking about that customer success, are all your users satisfied? Right. Do they have high trust in the data? Are they actively using that system? Remember the jet engine. Right. Remember the tracking. Right. Are we increasing usage? Are we increasing that adoption? Right. And most important, are you getting a return on your investment? And I think this is where business intelligence has actually failed in the past. I think there's been a lot of spend, but has there really been that return? And I question some of that. So we have to work on that too. Right. So we're putting in place a new, a new function, all right, called customer success. And view it as kind of a concierge, someone that you can talk to. Right. Now, the salespeople are doing an outstanding job, all right, in, in, this, in this arena, right? But sometimes you might just want to talk to somebody, all right, and you just have a question and you don't know exactly where to go, all right? So we're going to set things up so that you've got that person you can go to, all right? All right. And we want consistency. So today, of course, we are working with all of you in multiple ways. You know, you know, the lab talks to customers on an ongoing basis. Consulting talks to customers, you all on an ongoing basis. You know, sales, marketing, we're all involved. And of course, you will continue to go out to those individuals as necessary. But now our goal is to have one person that you can call. I have a question. I don't know where to go. All right. Customer success. All right. So with us, you know, it's personal, right? It's, it's, not, just, it's not just business, right? And that's our customer success. So now, what have we done over the last 45 minutes? Well, we've looked at our underlying technology from an airplane standpoint. It's the wings, the fuselage. We've looked at how they position the inside of the plane. We talked about competitive advantage. We talked about how the things improve over time. Simplicity, co-innovation, all of that ties together, all right, to make a winner in aerospace. And from our standpoint. We have some of the same things that we talked about for us. You know, the foundational technology, uh, the architecture, and what we're doing to change to it the applications, uh, the ones that, how we're improving them and adding to those, uh, the competitive advantage about how our philosophy uh, about customer focus really, um, you know, you, is used to uh, deliver excellent service to you all, uh, the continuous improvement that we do to the, to, the, um, to the platform and to the applications over time. Uh, my library, simplifying the interface, uh, which is a very challenge, which is an engineering challenge in and of itself. Uh, the co-innovation, where the, the, the lessons learned from beverage alcohol get applied to healthcare, and lessons from healthcare get applied uh, both, as well as the innovation that happens between both you and us. Uh, the future roadmap, which you were here uh, later on this morning. Um, tracking the progress in terms of monitoring what's going on and seeing where we should improve. And finally, the, the, key, the key puzzle piece, the customer success. 
so that we can that that uh, you succeed and therefore we also succeed, and that is it. And with that, Stan and I say thanks. Uh, breaks up next, and we actually have a little clock here, and we're down to right now. Yep. Perfect.